Okay, I guess so. I guess I could check. Yeah, I think it would be very respectful. Well, Mom, if I'd asked you, what would you say? I would have said, let's do it when tomorrow instead of tonight when we're tired and dad has got a headache and he's going to bed. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah. But I don't want you to have to prepare too much. I just figured at this point that I was going to have you interview him. Interview him? Oh, no, we're too tired. Yeah. Tired. I thought you were getting a cord to download. I told you. Well, the cord is there to do that. It's, it, Will a it cord fit? There that. Is it small enough to fit? Yeah, it's the same. It's the right cord, but I didn't pick this up for that, and I didn't even know that till I opened it up here. Oh, so I, that's what I thought you were doing. Well, I got two hours of tape, and, I, and she tells me that I can't. Uh, we can't do much more because it's 80 gigabytes, and I told her, "Well, I got a terabyte of storage, so I figure I can pretty much do whatever I want at this point. I just have to keep pulling tape." And, we're doing it. She gave me two tapes, two hours worth. Why don't we try doing it tomorrow? Well, we will. We will, but um, yeah. I just, I was hoping that you'd both be awake. How long did it take me to get back here? Uh, you know, I just got upstairs. I hadn't even brushed my teeth or anything else. I had enough time to change my clothes, and I was surprised when you walked, when I heard the garage door. Yeah. I don't know what this thing does here. There's all kinds of stuff in this darn camera. I don't know anything about it. I don't like that backlighting. That looks good. Um, the idea is to just get raw video and I'm going to dump it on the computer and burn it to DVD and just... Mm -hmm. I don't have the software to edit this thing with very well, but she's got it. Oh my goodness. And then we've got a structured interview in your hands. And how's it start? Oh, oh, is this what this is for? What's your astrological sign? Are you right-handed or left-handed? Well, there's all kinds of stuff on there, but you know, a lot of that stuff we already know. Are you nearsighted or farsighted? Are you overweight or underweight? I'm underweight. Yeah, you gotta come back as a hummingbird so you can eat half your body weight and sugar every day. That sounds good. <laughs> yeah, we always better than. Hey, this is pretty neat. Yeah, well, the idea is to get uh, have something for the future here. How many years? Are you know, you there's some Lord? questions like how did you meet your, your husband, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Which you probably will. Let's face it, you don't always tell the truth. Huh? You don't always tell the truth, Mom. About what? Anything. <laughs> no, I'm a very truthful person. Oh, jeez. She lies to herself. <laughs> I don't know much about this thing. I don't even know if it's working good. But I got it rolling and, and it's a pretty fancy deal. Hmm. Anyway, I, I got to get this back to her by Wednesday. Pretty neat. It's a good picture on it. I'll show it to you if you'd like. Yeah, let me stop it. Stop. Well, it stopped. I got it. Let's see. I guess if I hit record and release it. Yes. Yeah. And what is your name? Uh, John Kent, K-E-N-T. Is that your home address, John? Uh, that's my son's home address. We're just visiting. Okay. And where do you live, sir? I live in Alaska. And that's on a very can be reached at? 907-357-357. Yes, that's in Alaska. Okay. Is, is that a cell phone or is that a home number? That's a home number. Okay, what's the number you can be reached at here? So the officer of science can report over the phone. Okay, what's your number? 
Right. What's, what's your yeah, number? Does it look like they shot that with a BB or? Yeah, it looks like a BB. It must have happened during the night. Several others were shot too. There's several others on the uh, street that the rear window was, you know, knocked out completely. The window's still there, but it's all shattered. Safety glass. Must be tougher than the others. It was exploded outwards. And uh, it's in a motorhome. Yeah, we've got. So we'll call and take the report back. Is this like a hole in the head, huh? <laughs> oh, okay. Can't do anything about it except take care of it. Okay, who do we call? Uh, Safeway on the glass? Safeway. Safeway? Safeway grocery store? No, I said the glass. Oh. Did you get a number? No, I didn't look that up yet. Recording. Yep. You little turd. <clears throat> That's on tape. It's on tape. What's your favorite cuss word? <laughs> <laughs> That's on videotape. <laughs> Nobody can read lips. <laughs> I bet you could read it. Because <laughs> I know what it is. I have vowed <clears throat> to make it something else, but I don't know what. See, that's your father's favorite, too. I don't know how to do any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a Zuma on here and all kinds of What's stuff. What's the doctor tell you? I go to work tomorrow. Oh. Well, I guess we're going to be here tomorrow, Taylor. PB Zoom. It's not doing it. Playback Zoom. Okay. Menu. Insert. Did you find it, John? No, I'm still looking. Bring it over way. here, dear. A whole bunch of safe ways here. Safe light. Oh, safe light. Safe light? Yeah. S A F L I T E. Hmm. Safe light, all of light. Well, actually, we're going to get on the road right now. Say what? We're going to get on the road right now, so I need you to find your number and write it down and take it with us. Oh, yeah, we can report it in the car, dear. We need to go. Uh, if I could read these little goddamn Bring words. the phone book over here, love. Yeah. Looks like they don't See, have one. You don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't give me no respect either. Cave Creek Road, is that the nearest? Well, that's too far away. Cave Creek? Cave Creek's on the other side of town. Lamont, Cottsdale, Mesa, Tempe. This spot, Mesa and Tempe are close. Where is, is there a Chandler number? I didn't see one. I can't read that little okay, detail that old. much. Or it tells you what location is it even smaller than where the numbers are. Right over here, it's Safe Light. A bunch of Safe Light Auto Glass. Okay, that's Phoenix. Phoenix. Elwood, 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 Pepper Street. <laughs> Uh -oh. <coughs> Safe Light, Glendale, Phoenix, Phoenix, Cave Creek, Guadalupe Road, Tempe, Guadalupe, and Southern. That's it. Let me see this. Let's call them and we'll see if they get anything down here. Wait a minute. Jail, the tail is going to check it out. Oh. Ugh, it takes three of us to do one job. Jeez. Can you refer us to a uh, place anyway? Don't know. But let's get three quotes. 800 800 2727 is 24 hours to schedule. 2727? Mm hmm. 800 800 2727. And then the closest one in here is in Tempe, and that's 480 969. There's two numbers here. One is 4912, and the other one is 4550. Wait a minute. 969? Yep. Both of them? Yep. <clears throat> Go ahead. 4912 and 4550. 
That's it. sit down in the chair. I'm not doing it. You get over there. No, I don't know what I, he's done me. You did the whole thing with all this book and stuff? Well, you know, they just want your pictures, is that it? Well, you talk, but I don't know. You know what the hell is talk about? Well, I want to ask you some questions. Give me the little book. <coughs> Go ahead. Let me see. I got to set this. Sit back. Sit back. Okay. Now, for the beginning, why don't you just say your name, where you were born, what town, what state. You look good. Is that recording? Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's your name, dear? Uh, my name is John Forrest Kent. Where were you I born? I was born in Exeter Hospital, Exeter, New Hampshire, on the 23rd of September, 1929. And the youngest recollection that I can remember is that I had bronchitis. My mother took me back to the doctor, who was our uncle. And he gave up and said, there's no hope. And she brought me home. And we had a nanny named Grammy Nett. And she came up with this concoction of onions, uh, roasted onions in a bag. And they would cook up the onions, put the bag on my chest to draw out the soreness, and then keep repeating that. And I can remember to this day the smell of those onions uh, every time I smell them. And they, they tell me I was only a, a few months old at that time. After that, I don't remember anything until I went to the first grade and went to school. And we went to school in Newmarket and uh, went all the way through 12 grades, three different buildings, and graduated from high school. And that was 1947. <clears throat> My class had no anniversaries all those years. And they had a reunion on the 50th. And they enjoyed it so well that in 1997, they have a reunion every year since then. But we don't get to them all. And that's the end of my life. Oh, that is not <laughs> the end of your life. Well, you didn't have any more questions, so I guess I'm Oh, but you're just giving the background right <clears throat> now. Why don't you tell about what was your favorite class in school, high school, your favorite teacher, favorite color, favorite had, friend? Who was your best friend in I school? I never had too many favorite stuff in high school. I mean, didn't really, like any subjects in particular? No, I didn't really care for it. And I worked all the way through, uh, and when I was 13, I got a job at the grocery store, two doors down from where we live. And my first job was bagging potatoes. And potatoes came in a 100 pound bag, and you had to bag them up in these brown paper bags, five pounds in each bag. So that was my job, and I got 35 cents an hour. And uh, my best buddy in high school was Douglas Webb, and we did everything together. Never had an, an argument. We finally uh, separated when I commuted to the University of uh, New Hampshire, and he went to uh, Middlebury College in Vermont. And, uh, we hadn't seen each other until the uh, 50th anniversary of uh, Get Together. So that was about it. What about you and Fred, Fred and Douglas? And the yeah, well, Frederick York was what we called our Three Musketeers, but he lived out out in the country, and he went to school in Durham instead of Newmarket. So we didn't get together to see him too often. We have gotten back together with him in the last couple of years. And it's kind of interesting. It's, he has worked in constructions as a supervisor, and he worked for McDonald's for a number of years uh, recently. Uh, every time they built a new McDonald's, he was right there to supervise it. Now he's uh, not, no longer working with McDonald, but he's branched out and staying active, and he's 75 years old also. So he's, he's not retired, he's still working. A few people have been there. 
I'm still working at 75. He doesn't want to quit. <clears throat> so. But, but what about when your grandfather used to take the family for rides on Sunday? Oh, we used to go to uh, York Nubble, York Beach on Sunday. And my mother would make up a big picnic lunch, all sandwiches and uh, little hard boiled eggs and everything. And <clears throat> we'd take drinks with us and we'd all get in a little packet that my father had, which wasn't too old for them. But uh, we lived with my grandfather and uh, he owned a hardware store down in the uh, main floor of the building and then we lived upstairs in uh, two levels, the second and third floor. And <clears throat> my grandfather liked to, he, we had a den that he'd go into in the evening and he'd smoke a cigar. <clears throat> and he always had 724 cigars. So when we took our ride on Sunday, <clears throat> my mother and father would be in the front and uh, one of us kids up there and then the other two would be uh, <clears throat> usually my brother and I in the back seat with my grandfather. And he insisted that the windows be all rolled up. There was no open windows, no air coming in. And he'd smoke his cigars all the way to York Beach, Maine. <clears throat> and today, when we used to sit out on the rocks and look at the Nubble Lighthouse, it's just mansion upon mansion. They look like hotels instead of houses. And it's so uh, overly developed that you couldn't imagine it. And at that time, you could have bought a, a lot that had the view of the ocean, Atlantic Ocean, for a very few dollars, and nobody was smart enough to make an investment. Now they're out of sight in prices. So when we uh, were living together, my, my uncle, who was my mother's uh, brother, lived with us also. He was married, I guess, at a young age, and his, his wife, uh, his new wife, I, I think, died in the first year of the marriage, and then he never never remarried at that time. He was a bachelor. And uh, he always drove uh, Hudson automobiles, and my father and grandfather always drove packets. Well, one time my uncle had his Hudson vehicle at the garage in the market, owned by Shelton, C.K. Shelton. And he, uh, they gave him a loaner to take home because they were going to be working on his vehicle for several days. And behind the barn, where he had the cement and all the hardware material, it was a two-car garage. And he put his loaner car in there about 11 o'clock in the evening and about one in the morning, the garage was on fire and burned down completely and then burned down our automobile too. And uh, I always remember standing out on the porch, which was three stories up, and seeing the firemen uh, run a hose on the uh, upstairs window in the garage and they, they hadn't even broken the window. They didn't know enough to break the window to get the water inside. But anyway, that was a, a total loss. And so my mother was taking care of three of us kids, and my father, and my uncle, and her father. So that was a pretty big family for any one person to be making uh, a home for. Plus, we had store hours on uh, Friday and Saturday nights that went beyond 6 o'clock in the evening, so my mother would have to cook and serve food and shifts. So my father would come to eat, and then maybe my uncle, and then my, they'd go back to work, and my grandfather would come to have dinner. Well, that was that was quite a process. And uh, we lived right on the main street, the porch went out to the front. You could see right up and down Main Street and all the traffic and everything. Kind of got used to that. And then my folks bought a place of their own about 1952. And the, uh, the hardware store was sold, and um, the folks lived up on Main Street, 203 South Main Street, and that's where my sister Lois lives now. She uh, inherited the house. So the town has changed completely from since we were kids, and 
there's about 3,000 population at the most, and now they're talking exceeding maybe 10,000. And every pasture that we used to go out and hunt in and play is now subdivision material. And they're either condos or apartments or single family homes or duplexes and mansions and all kinds of stuff. The big developer in our town is Cheney, and they, they talked about changing the name from Newmarket to Cheneyville, but they never have done it, and he's still building. And I remember when he bought his first apartment house on Elm Street, and he, he started from scratch there and got into real estate. Psst, never mind, Cheney. So that's the end of it. No, that's I'm, not the I'm end saved. of it. No, 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 no. You well, haven't said anything about how you met me. <clears throat> oh, I don't I mean, I am an important part in your life, am I, don't I not? I know how I met you. How well, was that? Oh, well, when I was, uh, my father was raised on the, uh, on the farm down at uh, Durham Point, Great Bay, by his grandparents. And his father moved to Newmarket and uh, ran a livery stable. And my father stayed with his grandmother and grandfather. What and, were their names? Um, I can't tell you. They, uh, Eben? Yeah, it was Eben and... Uh, what was your grandmother's name? I don't remember. I, I can't remember. Anyway, he stayed there with them, and uh, when they passed away, then he decided to move to Newmarket, and he, uh, he sold the farm, and they raised horses and chickens at the time. So when I got up to be about 13 years old, he thought that I ought to have a project. Who thought to that? About? Raise a hundred uh, chickens. So we bought a hundred day old chicks and rented a chicken house that was up on the hillside behind where Carolyn lived. And, uh, I used to go and feed the chickens twice a day, summer or winter. And we kept track of all the expenses, all the feed, all the feeders everything that we did, and we raised the garden in the, uh, in the uh, yard beside the chicken house, and then uh, we used all those vegetables and so forth in the summertime, and then let the chickens loose to clean it up in the fall. And uh, anyway, uh, Douglas Webb, who was my uh, buddy, his father um, was a self-made millionaire, and he was the president of Twin Harbor Lumber Companies that were in Seattle and in Boston. But he lived there right in Newmarket and came home on weekends. And he had a big freezer, so he said that I would, I would, he would buy all the chickens that I had. And we fixed them up just like you know, store bought, wrapped them up and everything. And uh, when we finally finished up, and we sat down and figured out what it cost us and what we made, and it came out to, uh, exactly one dollar per chicken, so it made a hundred dollars after about 18 months of taking care of a flock of chickens. Uh, I guess that was my ent ent entry into uh, enterprise. And then uh, I saw Carolyn uh, go by her house sometimes. The, the path was two different paths you could get to the chicken house. So that's when I first saw her, and I don't know, we had a date. When was it? We started dating when I was 15 and you were 17. Yeah. So that was about it. That's about it for, 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 for your, your beloved wife, huh? <laughs> Thank you. Well, all right, how about your military career? Oh, well, they were talking about the draft in 1948, and I had gone to my freshman year in college, and I was in engineering only because all my uh, commuting fellows were in engineering. I decided that wasn't for me, so I was going to transfer to the business administration. But they were talking about the draft, so I decided to enlist in the Navy in the summer of 1948, went to Portland, Maine, and then went to uh, Great Lakes Naval Station and had uh, boot training in the Chicago, Milwaukee area and then came home for leave and then they shipped me as far away from New England as they could and they ended up in uh, California. 
and was assigned to an aircraft carrier. And the aircraft carrier was what they called on the milk run. We'd go out to sea for a week or two and then come back into Seattle or Long Beach or one of those ports, San Francisco, San Diego. And uh, they decided to put this particular aircraft carrier in the mothballs, and I was in the radar section where we had all these scopes to look at and the headquarters. And there was an off, I was a seaman first player. There was, a, there was an officer standing behind everybody that was looking at a dish to see if you were looking and seeing what you're supposed to see. I don't think we were too accurate in those days. But anyway, uh, they transferred us to the uh, Hunter shipyard in San Francisco, put the uh, uh, aircraft carrier in dry dock, and you had three choices. You could either get on a little safety seat and hang over the side of the aircraft about 200 feet up with a cement floor down there and scrape and, and paint, or you could work uh, KP in the kitchen, or you could work down in the bilges where they give you an air line and an uh, electric line for a light, go in there and scrape and uh, repaint. And, uh, so I decided to go to the bilges. Finally got done that chore and they took us to Oakland Naval Base across the uh, bay and we were being assigned to the USS Boxer, which was CV-21. They called it the Blackjack Ship. Well, they put us on a bus to go over to uh, Hunter Shipyard to get on the Boxer. And as we went across the Bay Bridge in the bus, the Boxer was going underneath the bridge. And we missed the ship. Well, they didn't blame us because we weren't in charge. We were just the slaves. And anyway, the boat was going to Alaska, so I missed my first trip to Alaska. I would have got a chance to see it in 1949, and then I only, I volunteered for one year's service, so I, at the, uh, in August 49, I went back home, went back to the university and to get my degree, and served in a reserve outfit, which was out of Boston, and I didn't have to go to meetings every week because of the distance, so I got some credit on that towards my retirement, and when I graduated, I, took a commission as a second lieutenant in the Army and uh, was shipped off to, uh, in February 54, shipped off to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia to take a uh, basic officer training course. Got on the train and went down. Yeah, I remember when I got off the uh, train, it was about midnight in Columbus, Georgia, and, and looked out and, uh, in New England. We hadn't seen too many black people, and, uh, one or two maybe in the community, and everybody was black when we got off the train, and they were playing Elvis Presley's Blue Suede Shoes, and finally caught a bus out to the Fort Benning and spent uh, several months there. They got assigned to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, went home and got the family and spent three years in uh, Fort Jackson. Then we got assigned to uh, Europe and uh, we were over there for three years, 60, 63. Well, first you went to Iran. Oh, yeah, that's right. After Fort Jackson, I took the family back to Newmarket <coughs> to live and I had a, what they call an undesirable assignment. Uh, by myself in Iran for a year. I was over there for basically 1957. Came back and uh, we went to uh, Fort Carson, Colorado. Another three year tour and then from there we were assigned to Europe. 60 to 63. And then transferred to the Finance Corps and came back to Fort Harrison, Indiana. Went to the advanced finance course, got assigned to Boston Army Base for three years, and then from there to uh, Command and General Staff College at uh, Leavenworth, Kansas, and then to Vietnam for a year. Came back and then had orders to Alaska in 1969, and then retired in, uh, at Fort Richardson, Alaska in 1976. Okay, it's on.
Well, Taylor was born and uh, we were married in uh, August 51. And Taylor was born in October 52. And I was trying to finish up college. And so I was working uh, night shift at the Micah factory in Newmarket and going to school daytime. And uh, it was a uh, joy to behold. And, uh, Tell how he, you used to take him in the bathtub with you. Yeah, I used to take baths with him and so forth. One morning he made a, a floating deposit. <laughs> so, anyway. Uh, <coughs> you used to take him in bed and sleep with you? Yeah, I used to sleep with him. We uh, were just barely getting by on a budget. And no, then uh, in the next year, Susan was born. And I remember she was born on one of the best waterfowl hunting days that there was. It was like a hurricane blowing. And I had taken uh, Carolyn to the hospital and I was standing by for word of what was going on. And uh, I guess I didn't work at the grocery store that day, but I couldn't go hunting either. So I was sort of in limbo. And finally she was born. And then when we uh, went into the military and got assigned to uh, Fort Jackson, uh, two years later, then uh, Jay was born. And, uh, he's the only one born in a military facility. And so we had uh, three children in four years. And decided that was enough. So uh, they've all gone their own. Schedules, so and we hope they'll make out all right in, in the future. What about what about hunting? You no, I decided that I was a waterfowl hunter at an early age, and uh, my father gave me one, gave me his shotgun to use. I used to go out before uh, high school in the morning. I had a license, had a vehicle at that time, and. Uh, I always come home at the early time and get ready to go to school. And my brother would be up and he'd say, well, what'd you get today? And I didn't, because I hadn't ever shot anything. Come home one day and he said, well, what'd you get today? And I said, well, I got two wood ducks. And he said, eh, I guess you did. And probably you did, yeah. And he went downtown to get a newspaper. And when he came back, he said, I want to see the wood ducks. And he showed them to him. He said, boy, they are beautiful. You ought to get one of those mounted. So, that's the way you got me started in my waterfowl collection. And uh, I got different birds over the years and uh, had a display that we kept at the house. And then finally, when I retired, I had them out at the Anchorage International Airport where a lot of people could see them. And I had to move them out of there. And currently, they're in the Diamond Mall. And we had uh, got up to 34 different had some of them destroyed in shipping in the military, but uh, right now we've got 31 different on display at the Diamond Mall in uh, Anchorage, Alaska in the year 2005. So I, I tried to, uh, I've traveled following the birds, I've shot some unusual ones that a lot of people don't have in their collection, such as the European Wigeon and uh, Estella's Eider. Stella's Eider is now protected. You can't legally shoot one. You could back in the 1970s. And uh, haven't pursued that too much lately. Got down to uh, one shotgun, which I think is all a person's need, person needs. If you've got a Benelli Super Black Eagle, and it's expensive, but that one shotgun will take care of all the shooting that you need to do various types of game and so forth. So I kind of enjoyed that. We went to a show here at, uh, in Phoenix on this past Sunday, a Saturday, Taylor and I and met Sean Mann, who I bought a, a uh, goose call from him back in the early 80s. And uh, he's enjoying his 20th anniversary in business and he's champion of champion goose caller and very good duck caller, and uh, we, we enjoyed talking to him. Am I out of time, thank God? No, no, no. 
Talk about going up to the shack. Oh, Talk about fishing. You haven't mentioned fishing. My duck hunting partner is uh, Charlie Ritchie. He's going to be 95 years old, uh, St. Patrick's Day. And he hasn't been out hunting much lately, but we met in 1970. And we hunted around different areas of Alaska together. And uh, he had a duck shack and we'd go out there and traditionally have the opening day of waterfall season together. And uh, the problem is to get into that place, you need at least about a 30-foot tide, and that tides vary greatly, and you need a 30-foot tide to come out of at least. So a lot of seasons we can't get in there for the opener, or we can't get in on any specific weekends. And uh, we do a, quite a bit of fishing in the summertime, and we go for um, halibut in the uh, Cook Inlet, which is at Deep Creek, which is about 225 miles south of where we live, almost to the end of the road. And uh, you can sport fish and catch two per person per day. The uh, biggest one that I have ever caught, I've caught two that weighed 175 pounds, and then we've caught a lot of others that are smaller. And we like to get the 30 or 40 pounders, which we call chickens, because they're real good eating. And then we fillet them out and uh, food saver, vacuum pack them and put them in the freezer and have them for the winter and give some to friends and so forth. And then when we go to the river, that's usually in May and June that we go after the halibut on the good, what we call the good tides. And then in July, we go to the Kenai River and they have uh, several runs of red salmon and king salmon. And uh, we fish there you can sport fish if there's enough fish coming up the river, which takes at least 20,000 or more on a daily basis. And some days we've had 100,000 fish come in the river. And then it's fantastic fishing. And then as residents, uh, we're allowed to dip net fish. So rather than dip net from the bank and stand in the deep water and the mud, we uh, dip net from the boat. And you have to have one person to run the boat. And then you have to have two nets, one on each side of the boat, and you're like trolling, troll speed. You get your nets tied on. If you try to do it with one net, you just go in circles. So you got to balance the boat with two, and then your net can't be more than five feet across with a suitable handle where you can push it down into the water, get it down near the bottom. And uh, we're allowed uh, personal fishing. Uh, by numbers of people in the household, and then we have a season limit on that. And when you get so many fish, you have to record them on your license. And then we uh, normally try to go with like three people, which is a minimum. And then if we got three households represented, they will split the fish three ways. And what I normally like to do is set a limit before we go because. We could conceivably come back with a hundred fish, and I don't want to ever do that in one one day or one tide. So we usually set a limit of maybe uh, 45 fish, and then we divide them three ways, so we get 15 apiece. And then our smoker that we use, which folds up and is portable, we wait now until we get home at the end of the season to do our smoking. But we can handle 10 big reds in that smoker at one time. So that would give us uh, 10 fish to put in the smoker, and then we'd have five that we could uh, fresh pack and uh, freeze and bring them home that way as, as fillets. And out of the average red, we would get uh, six to eight fillets, uh, three to four per side. And uh, we have quite a few days there that we can, if we can sport fish, we like to do that because it's a lot of fun. If there's a lot of fish in the river, then we can sport fish right near the campground that we're staying at. But if we, to go dip netting, we have to go down the river about 10 miles and get on the other side of the uh, bridge. And there's a certain area in there where you can dip net from a boat. And it's uh, pretty restrictive and there's sometimes there's several hundred boats in there and it gets really hectic. You've got to watch every minute front and back what, what you're doing. And, what these other people are doing so that you don't have any mishaps. And, uh, if we get a, a heavy load of fish, a lot of times we'll have 
Carolyn come with a boat and a trailer, I mean, the SUV and a boat trailer, and pick us up at the city dock, and then we don't have to fight our way back up river with uh, several hundred pounds of fish and three people in the boat. And you do it a lot quicker by by land. And, uh, then, it, of course, there's the Silver Salmon Derby in August, and the Silvers typically come in at the month of August all around the state, and they offer a lot of prizes and so forth. We haven't been to one of the derbies for quite a while. We usually finish up fishing the end of July, which is basically the end of king season and the end of the reds. And other than that, why August is smoking month and recuperating from all the <coughs> activity. And, uh, and of course, one September is the beginning of waterfowl season. Our seasons are very short there because we normally have freeze up the middle of October. And sometimes if the weather is really good in September, the birds stay north. And uh, when the big storms come up at the end of September, typically the birds will go right through our area, overfly it, and won't even stop. So we don't get much shooting that way at all. So several seasons we get drove down and hunted from South Dakota all the way to Texas. And We've hunted the Pacific Flyway all the way from Thule Lake, California to the Mexican border, which you can do on one non-resident license, so it's a kind of a pretty economical thing for freelance hunters that we hunt in refuges and so forth. And take our chances on the public drawings to we'll see if we can get access to some of the, the better hunting. Is my time out yet? No, how about talking about your grandchildren? Elizabeth Ann. Okay, we have two grandchildren. Three grandchildren. Your granddaughters. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter Susan uh, had a daughter. And named Catherine. And her name was Catherine. And, uh, She's living in Texas. She's now living in Texas, and uh, our son Jay had two daughters, uh, Susan, the uh, youngest, and she has a son by the name of Austin, and then we have uh, Elizabeth, and she is uh, now happily married, and both of the girls live in Boise, and are doing quite well. We occasionally can visit them and we'll be seeing them this summer. And we're looking forward to that. How many more minutes do I have? Oh, you got about 20 more minutes. 20? I thought I had 29 a few minutes ago. <laughs> I went no, I, I, I subtracted wrong and I didn't get it right. Um. I remember we used to go with the, uh, the minister would take a bunch of kids in the neighborhood. <clears throat> he lived just down the street from us and uh, he'd take a bunch of kids uh, up to one of the swimming holes to go swimming in the river, in the Lamprey River. <clears throat> and I didn't know how to swim. He was always trying to teach the kids how to swim and I just, I was just fearful of it. And every time it was my turn, he'd say, come on, John. I was they call me Forrest when I was a kid. Let's we'll see, you know, see what you can do. I could never swim with a dime. <clears throat> and then several years later, I got to meet a fellow in my class with the name of Paul Naughton. He was probably the skinniest, the thin person you've ever seen. He looked like a skeleton, even though he was a kid in good health. And he could swim like a fish. And, uh, where he lived, there was uh, part of the Piscassic River. <clears throat> and had a swimming hole, and he'd go in the air and over his head and swim one like man. So finally he taught me how to swim, and uh, I, I really enjoyed it after that. I was pretty fearful of that water for a long time, but it seems like all the, the fresh water in New Hampshire is 
you look at it and it looks black. I mean, you don't see the bottom of the stream or anything. And uh, once you got used to it and you knew what you were doing, it was all right. But it was a funny way to learn how to swim <laughs> from, from a friend. And, uh, it worked out pretty good. I'm going to stop it for a minute. It's on. Well, my father sold a farm, which has a beautiful field out front and a view of Great Bay, and Adams Island, and uh, Peninsula, and uh, McIntosh Island. And he did retain about 13 acres on the other side of the road uh, as you go towards at what we call the Adams uh, Peninsula, which was like an island with just a little roadway going to it. And we used to go down and visit the Adamses. And, uh, it was just like in the 40s, it was like in the 20s. They had no electricity. They had a refrigerator that again, ran on kerosene. All their lights were running on uh, kerosene. So it was like stepping back 20, 30 years in history to go down and visit them. And, uh, they had no uh, running water. They had to go down to the well in the field to get the drinking water. They had a variety of uh, outhouses, and, uh, some for summer, some for winter. And uh, this 13 acres that my father kept adjoined the Adams property, and they had a gateway there. And when it was for seven generations, the Adamses and the Kent family were neighbors. And they were the only neighbors they had as far as adjoining land. And on these 13 acres, my father had a a cabin, a cottage, pulled up over the ice in the bay. And I've never seen the bay frozen over in salt water. But that winter they were able to drag this cabin up over the uh, salt water on uh, ice with a pair of oxen and brought it up and put it on this 13 acres. And so we used to go down and say we're going down to camp for a weekend or uh, an afternoon or holiday or something, but every time my father announced that we were going to camp, we knew we were going to work, we weren't going to play. And he kept this pine grove just in immaculate condition, looked like a state park, and he didn't allow any twigs left, to, and we had to police them up and put them in a certain area. And pine cones, we even picked them up. The only thing we didn't pick up was pine needles. And it was just a, you know, a beautiful layout, but was work all the time we were there. And he kept a ladder that was probably 12 feet tall that slid under the bed as you went in the cottage. The cottage had a, uh, a porch, a deck, closed in deck on the front, and then just one room, and then a little loft up above, uh, halfway for a, a bed. And uh, <clears throat> so we would take that ladder out and put it up on the tree and then one of us kids would hold the ladder and the other one would go up the tree, go up the ladder as high as you could, a little saw, and you cut off these dead limbs. So we had them cut off as high as you could reach, probably 20 feet. And, uh, and of course, you know, once we knocked them down, we had to police them up. And it was a spring there, a well water, and we were always uh, catching frogs and getting them out of there with a sort of a trap in there. And uh, on a good high tide, the water would come right up to the uh, shore at the cottage. You could bring a boat in there. We, we had a boat and motor. You could come in there on a high tide, but you better not stay more than an hour. And an hour or two, the tide went out, and you were like two miles from the, the nearest water. So uh, we, we enjoyed that, uh, I guess, as much as we could. Eleven minutes. I remember one time, uh, old Cass Adams, old Captain Adams, uh, was a gundalow captain in the, in the early years. And he was uh, a carver, and he carved all the different ducks and geese and waterfowl that came in the bay. And he had a collection of them, miniatures, and then he had some big decoys he made. And Cass was a painter, so. Cass was the son, he painted paint up these decoys, his father would carve them. And I believe some of that collection is at the Smithsonian now. 
And then his father went in and uh, made a duplicate model of every sailing boat that ever came into the bay. And they lived between Great Bay and Little Bay on this peninsula, in a beautiful location. And uh, they could really tell you some stories about the old days of gunning and uh, using uh, sneak boats and floats and how many geese they'd kill in one shot with a gun mounted in the front of the, the float. And uh, I even borrowed a float one time and I uh, used it in fresh water and just drifted down a river because I wasn't, I was too dumb to know how to skull. And uh, I got some ducks that way, but uh, I don't know what ever happened to those boats. I, I returned the one that I borrowed. But uh, one time Cass and I decided to get together on a, one of his cousin's ponds up in uh, Barrington. And we went up the day before the season opened, and uh, one September, of course, and stayed overnight uh, at his cousin's place. And uh, we snuck up on all these different ponds. He must have had 10 of them. We spent the day sneaking on these ponds. We were going to get wood ducks. And, black ducks and so forth. We never saw a duck all day long. So we come home and uh, on the way home we went by the, my father's old property and there was a, like a, a double pond right beside the road. There's a bunch of uh, black ducks out in the pond when we went by and they flew off. And I said something to Cass. I said, gee, the ducks are coming in here and the, the old homestead was down there a ways and they didn't allow people hunting. And I said, well, I'll bet you'll be some ducks here probably tomorrow morning. He said, well, I don't know. It's just so close to the road. So anyway, I took him home, went home. The next morning I couldn't sleep. I decided to get up and I had my father's double barrel and got in the car and drove down there and uh, put the car on the side of the road and walked up in there and got down beside the pond and scooched down and I had the shotgun across my knees. And about that time, here comes a bunch of ducks, and they just kept coming in there, funneling in there. They're pushing each other out of the way to get to the water. And of course, we were only a short flight from the salt water, and they were coming in to get their morning fresh water. And I kept moving my shotgun real slow, and I finally got it up to the level, got it up to my shoulder, and I fired it out across the top of all these uh, duck heads. And a whole bunch of them fell out. I fired another round, they all jumped up. And I got up and I ran as hard as I could to get back to the car. And I went down and got Cass out of bed. <laughs> and he's wearing his long johns. And we come back up to the pond. And none of the, the people you know, on the property, they hadn't come around or anything. So he pulls off his trousers and he goes right out there and wades out there. And he picked up all the ducks. And I don't know, we had 10 or so, I guess. And got him, got him back to the car. We would drove back down to his place, and on the way a pheasant came out uh, across the road, and that's really unusual for that area. We don't see very many pheasants, so we had both thrown our guns in the back seat, and we're trying to sort out. I think he had a 20 gauge, and I had a 12. And we're trying to sort out guns and ammunition. Finally, I, I got mine and went out there, and the pheasant took off, and I shot him. They got him and we went down and we had a picture taken on the front of their uh, building down there where they lived. And that was a three-story resort type uh, hotel at one time. And we had a picture taken out on the front porch and had these ducks lined up and, and the pheasant. And uh, yeah, Cass is standing there with his, and his long johns. His wife took the picture and uh, mud up to his waist. And we get we had a picture of that for some time, and uh, that was really uh, an enjoyable place to visit. And then over the years, they they were offered a million dollars after a cast. Uh, they built a gundalow, uh, 44 feet long, and launched it on the uh, Captain Adams' birthday when he was 90, and. Uh, he passed away the following winter, and Hollywood was willing to give him, I think, $25,000 at that time for it, but they, they just pulled it up on shore, and I think that's where it eventually rotted. And then Cass was, I guess, in his 60s, and he, what he had was an uh, appendix attack, and they didn't get him to the hospital quick enough, and uh, he passed away. 
And then that uh, island was offered to an uh, individual wanted to buy it for a million dollars. And anyway, the, uh, the wife saw it fit to give it to the uh, state uh, of Alaska, the uh, state of New Hampshire for university and marine biology. And that's the way it stood. How did you talk about the first boat you built? Of the one and only Oh, I, I bought a kit that my folks didn't know about. I bought a kit through the mail and had it delivered. And it was a little racing boat. And I always wanted to go fast in the boat. And my brother always got the boat. And he'd have some kind of old sailboat that you couldn't get any speed up to at all. So I built that out of a kit in the garage and uh, took it out and uh, had a 12 horsepower engine on it. And put the power to it and boy that thing just got up and took off down the river. And I'd, I guess you'd be going 25, 30 miles an hour with it. And it didn't weigh hardly anything. It was only nine and a half feet long. And Carolyn's brother went for a ride with me one time. They lived right on the waterfront. And I did a, a fast U-turn and I threw him right out of the boat. And I had to turn around and come back and pick him up. And then we had another fellow in the river that he thought he had a pretty fast boat. He had the same size motor, so one day we were coming back, I guess from clamming, and he flagged me down. He said, well, how about a race? And I said, okay. So we went up the end of the salt water before you could get to the dam, we turned around, and we waved at each other and took off, and uh, the river narrows down with two big boulders, and I was looking to see if we were going to get through that together, and then I looked back, there was nobody in sight. I went back looking for him, and he ripped the back end of his uh, boat right off. The motor ripped the back end of the boat off and uh, sunk. And, uh, of course, he was hanging on to the boat. We got him out, and we went and got a pair of oyster tongs and got his motor off the bottom. So after that, we all, he was older than I was. He was probably old enough to be my father. And he, uh, we always called him Dipper Duck after that. <laughs> He never asked for another boat race. I knew I could beat him because I had half the weight he had in his boat. And just the way it was designed. So uh, I kind of enjoyed that. And I, don't, I don't even remember what I did with it. I guess I sold it to somebody. Got rid of it and uh, get ready to start traveling in the military. You don't carry a bunch of baggage around with you. We did carry it with us though when uh, the yes, first we did. Move that we yes, made. we did because they moved it with our household. We put it on the back of yeah, the truck. Yeah, they put it on the tailgate <laughs> of the great big eighteen-wheel van and stood it up on end. That's how they could get it on there. And uh, it, the, uh, I don't know what else to say. Well, have you enjoyed doing this? Doing what? Recording this. Oh yeah. You have so many more stories to tell. Oh yeah. yeah. I don't know. Half of them are worthwhile. Everything's worth, worth listening to and all. Everything's just, uh, worth uh, It's been a full 75 years, I guess. Yeah, good 75 years, eh? So, this was a good thing I stayed in the military. How about me? And, uh, good thing I married your mother. Your mother. Oh, yes. Good thing I married Carolyn. Mm -hmm. Good thing I got married. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna. I'll. I'll stop it. Yeah, stop okay. it. Save me.